Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Candid Crack. And today we have a special guest, Morris. How are you doing? I'm very well. Hello, guys. And uh, hello for anyone tuning in to watch this. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Morris. Um, let me start with the first question. Um, explain me a little bit more who Morris Pentel is. Um, I'm a family person. Um, I'm a behavioral engineer. I'm a really bad guitarist. And uh, I'm a dog dog lover and what I do is I design experiences and change behaviors that's okay. my kind of I work see, yeah you, so you already kind of uh, introduced the, the second part of the question is uh, explain it me a little bit more about what you do so I need to just put it into context. I've spent a lot of my career involved in technology, but I've also spent an equal part of my tech, uh, my career involved in behavior. And so when it comes to the idea of transformation, understanding how behavior works and how technology works means that you're actually able to build experiences. And when you build experiences, what you're doing is changing behavioral outcomes. So you can make a team feel more positive by doing certain things. You can make them feel more stressed by doing other things. And making people, making the boundaries for people and controlling their daily experience in terms of what you're trying to deliver means that you can transform a business unit or transform an organization because improving people's behavior and experience towards each other is, uh, is something you can replicate across any part of an organization. I don't know if that makes clear sense. It, it sort of does. Um, my, my question is going to be, I guess, a, a quite a, an academic start. What do you mean by experience, Morris? Because th that's quite a, a wide-ranging thing. So, so what, what, what exactly are you talking about? So experience, like, uh, 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 unfortunately, all of the things that we're talking about is the quantum sum of what happens in any given moment and how we perceive it over different periods of time. And that ranges from the circumstances and context, which plays a huge role, the current situation as it's unfolding and the outcome in terms of what you feel and what you remember from it. So scientifically speaking, everything is part of the experience. So, it, it, you know, years ago, I started a thing called the Customer Experience Foundation. Um, but what I've come to learn is that all experiences follow the same scientific dynamics. There are a set of rules those rules are, I'd say relatively simple, but there's an, awful, there's an awful lot involved there. But it's that simplicity that allows us to understand and organize the huge complexity that sits underneath it. And the classic example I will give you is ensuring that the agent in a call center is thinking about whether or not the customer was in a good mood at the beginning of the call or a bad mood, and if the agent helped make the customer feel better about themselves. And if the agent made the customer feel better about themselves, then they will recognize that they've done something nice, and in which case, 
gosh, they'll probably feel a little better about themselves as well. And that's one detail out of not an infinite number of de it, uh, an infinite number of types of detail, but a, a, but, but a relatively small pattern of experience that we can interfere with simply by adding either more positive or negative stimuli and therefore changing the outcome for the person. In other words, Maya Angelou is, is famously uh, quoted as saying, you know, people don't remember what you say or something like that, but they remember how you make them feel. In fact, it wasn't that she wasn't the first person to say it. Um, but uh, we remember feelings, we remember experiences, what, what the, how we model the world, how we think can be improved and changed. And you asked me what I was before us when I guess one of the things that I, you know, I, I didn't mention is I'm also a therapist. And helping people over fears, phobias, compulsions, obsessions, and helping them into, uh, into a more positive framework is the type of work that I've been involved with for about 15 years. I trained me as a subject, used to, I, I, I part-time still run a clinic on the subject. So the idea of helping people to improve their behavior in order to improve performance that's not rocket science, that's common sense. We know that from thousands of studies from every university in the world. So you've got, so, you've got, it, you've got two yeah. components here that, that, that have sort of sprung to mind. You've got your therapy work, which is sort of a long-term um, improvement. So, so if you're, if you're doing uh -huh. therapy with someone over a period but experience no. seems to be a little bit shorter or, or am I getting wrong as to what therapy is? So there are, let's imagine a situation where you have a specific thing that you are frightened of, right? And we could put that into the personal context and let's say that you're massively afraid of spiders. Okay, or we could put it into the business context and say that what we are really afraid of is taking new ideas to management because there isn't the appropriate culture of innovative thinking. All right, so either one might be true, but for the moment, let's assume that you're scared of spiders. So there are a few things I want you to do. Number one is I'm going to change your perspective on your relationship with spiders and when they're dangerous and when they're not and how much of your fear is merely a behavior pattern, get you to understand that behavior pattern, help you to have some tools in order to get past that and do that in a relatively short period of time. So I can stop someone smoking in about 80 to 90 minutes. Uh, now, I also have to bed down some changes to their behavior and their chemical balance. So what I'm looking to do is to find moments of habit, which are a way of anchoring things into people's day changing the middle part and therefore the outcome. So in other words, at one o'clock, I like to do this and I will go and do this and I will go and do that. Well, if I can get you to change at, uh, at one o'clock, I go and do something else and the outcome is slightly different, then what I've done is I've changed your perspective. So the first thing I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get you to get a different vision of, of your situation and your relationship. Uh, you're much bigger than the spiders. You're probably more intelligent. Therefore, you should be able to outthink the spider and th therefore you've got the advantage. So why are you in a panic? Yes, they don't look good, but probably you've dated someone less good looking than that. 
And by the time I finished reframing that picture, I've embedded with them a series of habits that will help them to build that new view of the world over a period of the long term. So it's short-term intervention that creates a long-term set of behavioral changes. And I'll give you an example, a really practical one. We know that people on early shifts uh, start to flag mid-afternoon. Well, currently, another part of the answer to the question, who I am, I'm an operational manager. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, one of my team comes up with a joke. And that joke goes around the team, but it also goes around a whole series of other teams. And that starts the conversation. And we have a brief period of lightness. And naturally, as that's become a habit, people start to look forward to it. People start to contribute more and therefore stay more engaged in their work. So in both cases, what I've done is I've made really small changes in order to create better outcomes and embed a series of habits. And whether or not that's the habit of innovation, whether or not that's the habit of some kind of conversational improvement, because there's another one of my hats, Oscar, I study uh, conversation and I engineer and improve conversations. And again, if you think about conversation, conversation is an experience in answer to your question, Richard. So a um, conversation, go on. Yeah, yeah, so um, again, this is, this is probably very simplistic, but the way that what I'm hearing is you've got these um, emotions that are considered somewhat more negative. So you've, so you've talked sort of, sort of fear and anxiety and boredom. And, and you're, you're hacking into them with, with some, some level of positivity. Well, what, what that is, is, is it, yeah. it maybe may differ. And out of it come better experiences and better outcomes for everybody involved with, with, with these various different experiential moments or events. Bingo. Or and as a result of that, there is a change to their chemical balance. So, and that's an important one thing, a thing if you're trying to stop someone smoking. What you want them to do is to spend more time doing exercise and more time smiling because both of those release different kinds of chemicals that actually uh, reduce the need, the need and the addiction for nicotine a little bit during that process. And there's a whole raft of medical science about why that bit works. There's a whole raft of medical science about how reframing works and how you do it. So I guess another part of me is that thing of an innovator of being able to steal from great ideas and then bring them together into practical magic. <laughs> Stealing ideas from other people, then, of course, I'm very intrigued by that, especially the innovation part, right, uh, uh, Morris? But the, the, the other thing that, that you mentioned uh, and that Richard, I think, referred to as well is, is those mini interventions or disruptions. So yes. uh, talk a little bit more about that. So let me talk about it on two scales. So one is a micro intervention and the other is simply a change to three or four moments that, will, that are uh, impactful on outcome. So how you answer a phone call and how you speak to someone in the first 10 or 15 seconds will impact the outcome. Now, that just to be clear, the circumstance under which the person is speaking to you is the first factor in the equation. The delivery of them to you as a person is a factor in the equation. And then finally, how you open that conversation is a factor. So I can measure that third factor really easily. If you say hi and I say hi, 
then what that indicates in conversational terms is a moment of equality. If I say hi and you say, I have a problem that I'd like you to solve, then clearly one of the parties is more active, has a more significant level of active purpose and an agenda, and is already deciding that the niceties are not the most significant thing of the moment. So by stepping back from the complexity and simply saying, is this moment working or not? What you're able to do is to find small interventions. Now, one of, uh, one of the people who I've come to admire is, a, a, is a, a lady called Liz Stoker, who's a professor at Loughborough. And she does amazing work in conversation analysis. And in certain circumstances, she tells a story where a 0.7 of a second hesitation means a, a really high probability, it's late 80s or 90s, I don't remember the exact number, that you're about to say no. And our ability to understand that complexity and to do something about it in a really simple way by may, maybe moving a piece of information around, by maybe not saying something in a particular way, we're able to change the outcome. And another one of, uh, of Professor Stoku's uh, great examples is that in one of the uh, in one of the studies that she did, and you can you can see this on video, and I'll, I will provide you the links, Oscar please do get people to have a look at it. But she talks about the difference between saying, will you, and would you be willing? And if you say, will you, people are more likely to hesitate and more likely to say no. But if you say, would you be willing, then what you're really asking is are you the sort of person who is prepared to do this? And therefore you have a higher probability of success. Now, if I spread that out to answer the original question, Richard, and I'm so sorry that I have wandered, but you guys know me, it is a complicated subject in bringing it all together. But all of those elements are the experience and that experience doesn't then stand there alone because how I feel about it at the end of it becomes less important in a week or a month or an hour. And when I talk about it to people, the way that I describe it will also affect my view of it. So experience is actually, it's a quantum state. It exists in the now, but it is also a series of waves. It is both the microsecond and the millisecond, which we're now able to analyze elements of. And I gave you my example of that 0.7 of a second delay. We're now, we're now talking about looking at a customer journey in terms of you know, microseconds and milliseconds. And then at the other end, I can simply train people to answer the phone in a slightly different way. And that will completely change the outcome of a proportion of phone calls. So tricks can help, some tricks can help with some things, but no trick solves everything. It depends on the number of things that you have to deal with as to how you build people's confidence in handling them and therefore what the outcome is likely to be. So, you know, uh, to simplify the whole thing down, if you teach someone to fish, it's better than if you give them fish. And that is one of the key elements of transformation that I think I've seen work most successfully in organizations. You can transform a, an organization, not by trying to, to, to become the expert in everything and therefore retrain people, but by planting, and I know at the moment, I actually no, I'll, I'll use a different phrase. 
It's by planting an antibody that goes across that corporate culture and therefore infects it in a more positive way. Because I, I know that in a recent uh, drinking dialogues, you guys have been talking about the number of thoughts we have a day and how many of those are positive and how many of those are negative. Well, I, I believe the number uh, that was being discussed is 6,200 or something like that based on a, a, a study. And that a significant proportion of those are, are negative. Well, if I can change 15 or 20 or dependent on the problem, maybe one or two or simply, or, or perhaps in a more complicated situation, a hundred of those thoughts and turn that into a habit, then what I've done is I've transformed an organization. And you know what, it's really cheap, but it does require work and it requires reinforcement. You start somebody off with a quick change. That change needs to be quite short. And then what you do is you turn it into habit. So the three o'clock joke, my, my example of, of, of something we do at the moment, has now spawned the four o'clock riddle. I have two experts. One is, called the prin one is called the Prince of Smiles and the other one is called the Riddler. And these are, you know, that they, they love those particular subjects. And, and I know that people look forward to those, those little bits in their day. So by changing a little bit of a habit, by changing how people start a conversation, uh, I don't think uh, answering the phone with welcome to X organization when I'm phoning to complain is necessarily the things that I want you to come out of your mouth straight away. What, Mar what Morris, would, would yeah. you be willing to go a little bit darker? Um, oh. Because... <laughs> Because, okay. because there's, there's some, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I want to, to ask a sort of a, a, a slightly darker question with this. I, I, I went to listen to Richard Thaler talk about misbehavior and, and behavioral economics and nudge. And, and, the, the ethic, and one of the questions that he was asked was the ethical dimension of it. And his answer was just, oh, well, we sort of know what's good and what's bad. And therefore we, and I'm, I was just like, that is just, given the power of this, that is an unacceptable answer. So I know that you're not going to give me an unacceptable answer because I know you quite well by now. But but the ethical the ethical wrestle, as in you know you can use this for for all kinds of different uh, purposes, some somewhat more nefarious, nefarious than others. How do you wrestle with the ethical challenges of of being able to do this? So the ethical challenges are. Not a, not a question to be dealt with semantically. Engineering behavior is a, first of all, it's something that's already going on in a really big way and has been going on for a period of time that would surprise you. You know, the, the, the sheriff of Nottingham back in the day made examples of people in order to ensure that, that, that a certain type of behavior from the rest of the villages. Um, you know, behavioral engineering is not new, but the level to which we can behavior, behaviorally engineer people is a massive ethical dilemma that we should be talking about now I personally think that there have been huge behavioral crimes committed, but as we don't have behavioral crime on the statute books anywhere or even properly discussed, there's a real challenge there. So from my own personal standpoint, what I do is I don't tell everybody everything at all. I teach people how to do small benign things. I don't publish because I'm scared to, because my work can be used for bad purposes. 
And when I think about my 25 or 30 years in the contact center industry, we built really bad rabbit hutches that do really bad things. And that's personally not what I wanted. So the idea that I can interfere with people's behavior, well, I am governed by medical ethics personally. And in, put, in terms of putting my business hat on, I've turned down at huge expense uh, the majority of offers to change organizations. I don't want to help people gamble more. I don't want to help organizations be bad to their employees. I don't want to help uh, organizations take advantage of their customers, which as a behavioral engineer means that I tend to keep that hat for things like this discussion and drinking dialogues and for my work on the mathematics of thought. Because it is a dangerous subject and currently I would say too few people understand what we're able to do. Too few people are discussing what has happened as a result of that. And I'll speak to that very briefly, if I may, in a second. And then too few people are thinking about how do we control this and how do we deal with those significant ethical issues. So uh, if we go back a couple of years to Cambridge Analytica, one of the whistleblowers uh, with a remarkable hairstyle, his name was Chris, but I forget his surname for the second. It may come to me, but I am old. Um, he, was talking, uh, he was talking about a bloke in Canada who was busy sending millions of Facebook impressions of violent scenes targeted at, at, at young people in a particular African election. And I'm fairly sure it was the Nigerian election, and I'm fairly sure that he was targeting people between 18 and 24, but this was years ago, and I probably read 10 reports a day. But I remember his testimony to the committee and he was explaining that what they were trying to do was to swing voters in one particular direction. And I thought, hey ho, that is behavioral engineering. And the bloke was in Canada and the client was somewhere else and he was using Facebook. And I'm sure he went home with his $45,000 a year or $60,000 a year, or maybe he was a data scientist in order to do this. I don't know anything about the bloke and probably he was earning a quarter of a million pounds a year. I have no idea. But at no time anywhere was that a crime. Mm. So not only am I highly aware that the ethical issue is one of the biggest things which is why I will only teach people how to do good stuff and I will only teach them a limited amount of it because I'm genuinely scared of what we understand and can do I have a problem that I'm ethical but not necessarily everybody else is and I see a huge amount of evidence of behavioral engineering going on, some of which is benign and some of which is not, which is why, you know, I'm involved in a health program. I'm involved in the UK's uh, effort on the pandemic. So right now, helping to change people's behaviors, I, you know, I work on the front line, my feedback ideas. And if I can, yeah, if I can make that work better, I'm really comfortable. I, I have a, a, a sort of a, a question that I want to go into the, the kind of stuff that we regularly talk about, which is organisational performance, Norris, because I'm very interested yeah. in this. Because one of the things you've you've discussed, or you mentioned a little early on, was almost giving people a reflective awareness of the behaviour. Okay, so there's a degree of reflectivity and, and creativity and criticality that you're you're giving the person. Whereas a lot of behavioral engineering in, in organizational terms have been around the idea of culture and compliance and behave this way, et cetera, et cetera. Do you play around with that tension at all? And, and, and it's important within the leadership discourse in, in the, 
they want creativity and criticality and reflective awareness and they want compliance and they want and, and it doesn't all work together within so yes all of these things have to work within really really tiny margins in order to in order to operate in a cohesive system so there is a question of managing the balance of those ways so on the one hand what i'm doing is i'm laying out at senior team level um at the the big uh, you know uh, 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 the, the big ideas in terms of what the outcomes we are seeking how we measure our progress towards them and how we make them work and the bit about the how we make them work is by focusing on two or three key elements but it varies according to the change you're trying to do so it may well be that you need a big picture story um that you've discussed with people prior to implementing something but that's not necessarily always a helpful thing to do in other words, you may not necessarily want to stand there and say to people, here is the story, and you tell them this massively long story, and the bottom line is you're going to make an elephant disappear at some point. Yeah, and that may be the way to go, but actually, in my experience of business transformation, which goes back to the age of the telex machine, and, uh, and actually building, you know, uh, uh, we used to build customer journey maps on paper, not because it was cool and we had post-it notes, but because we didn't have computers. Um, so the idea is that maybe what you're doing is you build your operational plan, you engage management in order to get permission to make it work, but what you're delivering at the front end is perhaps very small chunks of targeted behavioral engineering focused on changing one or two habits. And then what you do is build on that, having mastered that change, which you're able to monitor, you then add another one. And so people become used to the idea of changing, but they're, the, the human experience is a subjective thing and we don't all march to the same beat. So we've got to keep it really quite simple and allow it to express itself um, at the level and in the way it works for that individual. And we can't plan for what that looks like. I'm sorry, I realize half of my, my face is now uh, lightly brit, but the sun's come out, which is delightful. Um, but so the answer is that, that, yes, management needs to buy into it, as all, that's always true. But where most organisations uh, spend too much time is trying to get mid-level managers to make changes. And the thing about being in mid-level management is it's really hard work. There's probably too much to do. And with the best will in the world, the next program is not necessarily going to be your highest priority. Whereas if I can give you one small change that makes someone's day slightly better, if I can change the beginning of a phone call so... 20 out of your 54 phone calls today or five out of 15 actually turned out slightly nicer than you expected. I've created a change that I can then build on and create transformation. So I can't transform an organization in a day I can transform one tiny bit of its experience in a few hours. 
And the difference with that is the, the infrastructure that you need to bed it down, all of that is a real organizational issue, but you even put that into the same change process. So people try and resolve one thing at a time. And this, I guess, to some extent, goes back to a period in my, in my history where I'd worked for all of the major suppliers in contact center technology for a long, uh, a long period of time. And because of my discipline in uh, logic and, and, and thinking and my connection with technology, if you had a broken system, I was a really good person to come in and to solve a problem. Because what I first want to know as a discipline is what do we know and what do we don't, what is it we don't know? Uh, and then what are the question marks? Because we don't know that we're asking, we know what, what have we no idea about? And then focus on what we know. So what we know about someone's day is this or that. What we know about someone's experience is this or that. Where the world of artificial intelligence and computing is currently at odds with some of the work that I'm doing, but I am working with some extraordinary people who are helping me to translate these ideas into uh, different types of AI algorithms. Um, what, we, what we know is much simpler it, because how we understand things is much simpler than the amount of data available to us. And I think everyone keeps hoping that if we feed enough data into artificial intelligence, one day it'll suddenly go and it will be a mirror of the human condition. And the answer will be 42, yes. And the answer <laughs> will be 42. Whereas in fact, uh, Richard, I know you have little ones. And I know that if they were, you know, it, 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 I talk about the past and the future and the present as, you know, in, as, in quantum terms, you know, they may remember, because I know how young they are, what it was like to actually go out into a park. But all, most of us, and, you know, certainly most of the people right there who are, if you're still listening, uh, you will remember what it's like to be outdoors and you will have an instant recognition as to who's okay and who's not and what's going on without really taking in a massive amount of information. We have a very clear understanding about something being okay or not, something being active or passive, something being aggressive or positive, something being good or bad. And it's to some extent or another. And that's how we see the world in our 6,000 odd thoughts. We see things really quickly. And my point is that when you take just some of those, you can start to build metrics that will then start to correlate with your financial pictures. So I'm not saying that we're looking at the wrong things. I'm just saying we're looking at them in the wrong context. What I want to know is at the end of every phone call, were people happy? And if they were or weren't, to what extent? And how does that impact the cost and operational time and expenditure of managing that call? And does that therefore fit with our corporate goals? But without information, by looking at things that really matter in people's days, we start to build metrics that bear more relationship to what is important to profitability than an awful lot of the technology-based stuff. And I'll ask you both, what's the difference between speech analysis and conversation analysis? I'm going to ask you, you haven't said anything for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. I, I'm so I'm clearly not the, the expert in here, right? So uh, I, I don't know how to answer that. But I do have a question back for you, by the way, Morris. You, you make the, you, you, and, and maybe Richard can answer that question that you ask us. But the, you, you made this argument uh, uh, to 
explaining that most people will recognize will recognize if someone is okay or not okay. You no, know, they can actually read people people's emotion quite well. That's I think what you just said there. I but... do, uh, what I would I, I wouldn't say most people can do it well. I would find to be a true statement if we're being exact. What I would say is that most people can recognize what's going on in their environment and therefore tell if someone is in severe distress or is excessively over buoyant and overactive because that's the way we understand the world within our model of fear and you know flight and all of those kind of elements when we walk into a room, when we're at a party, when we're in a meeting, with very limited amounts of data, we make decisions about what's okay and what's not, and who's, who has an exception to that in one way or another. So, so what I was, and, and that's, that, that, I mean, that's a fair point, what I was trying to get to in, in if that's true, right? So if you uh, talk about the workplace environment, how is it that so many people don't recognize those signals? in terms of well their own that someone is upset they don't even recognize either the team members maybe don't say anything i don't know what what that is but if it was so clear what why is it that that we have so many misbehaviors um i shall answer the question in two parts and the first one i guess uh maybe even a sufferism but it, but but um when you consider the boards of the world's largest organizations, how, um, uh, uh, how many of them have a senior board member responsible for behavioral science? So what we have, you know, what we, uh, our organizations are of course changing over time and they've changed since I first started out in work a very many great, uh, you know, a, a very long time ago, uh, and they will continue to adapt over time. I remember I was one of the first heads of customer experience in an organization at a time when people asked me what that meant. Now, that's because what we'd had previously was we'd had the bloke who built things, and it used to be a bloke. I, you know, I'm using this, you know, as well culturally. If you think how far we've, how far we've come, uh, and where we're, where we're, we're going to, there'd be the bloke in charge of sales, there'd be the bloke in charge of money, the finance guy. Whoops. There'd be the. Sorry about that. There'd be the bloke who um, who, who uh, made the final decisions, and um, and there'd be a girly who'd sit there and take notes. Now what we're in is we have digital, we have compliance, we have all of these other things built on, and each one has come from a particular need, but those needs have come through the root of operationality and technology, rather than coming as some recognized technology geniuses like Steve Jobs, you know, observed, if, if um, you know, if I'd have asked people if they wanted an iPad, you know, it, it, people wouldn't have thought that such a thing was possible, and I think, Henry Ford famously said people wanted faster horses. Yeah, there's a, that, 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 that there are elements here that, that, that they're massively complicated. And so because they're massively complicated, that's not how we think of them. That's not how we think of the world. So if we, if we go back to the human basics and say, what is it that people don't think about? And I guarantee that if I had the reach in the world to, to, to get people 
in every major call center across the world to, to tell us what metrics they use to understand emotion, they would be submetrics in some way. They, they might have some equation on feelings or even worse, some connected map of, uh, of words that, that puts things together. But will they ask the basic question, did the customer feel better? What happened that made them feel better? What I've learned is that by teaching people to become a little bit more aware of what's going on is a necessity because all organizations have been built on the progress from paper reports and methods of working through the age of digitalization, through the age of organization driven by social conscience, for want of a better term, or social mores, perhaps is a, a, a better term. And so teaching people, organizations to actually use people better is number one, not a new challenge. It's existed throughout time. But number two, behavioral science has exploded over the last 30 years, in part due to the revolution in, in artificial intelligence, which has allowed us to look at small things much, much better. Because in the grand scope of behavior, you know, all these interesting little bits that people do, they're only tiny little bits of the bigger picture. But they give us a very clear indicator of what's important and what isn't. And I would rather know that I've shortened your conversation because the customer started to cooperate. They finished your sentences for you. They became your friend. When I talk about customer experience, what, I, what I'm talking about is this analogy of, there's a reason why cars, supercars look slick. There's a reason why airplanes look the way they do. There's a reason why boats look the way they do. Why would human experience be different? We may find it funny watching people do these quiz games where they have to overcome obstacles like lava off the floor or whatever it's called. I, I, I forget, my kids have shown me this. Uh, it's awful and wonderful and terrible and, and mad. But we, we don't do really basic things. And our organizations don't do really basic things. So this is, this is so, going to shift me back a little bit to trying to answer that question that you posed about analysis and conversation analysis. Because I think, and I think what you're talking about here is somewhat in the difference between the technical and the, the emotional as well. And, and I think they all sort of link together. That, that, that we've sort of got all these technical things, and everyone's very interested in technical things, and, and, and they will measure technical things. And I think if that's that speech analysis. It's the technical measurement of the utterance and blah, blah, blah. Conversation analysis is where all the emotionality comes in, the relationships, the interactions, the beliefs, the, the habits, the, the blockages, the slippage, you know, all of these kind of things that stop maybe that streamlined way of work going forward which is messy to deal with but if you actually do start dealing with it then in really interesting things can happen and so you know one of the one of the key areas of my work that i am okay sharing because we have talked about the moral side of things is speech patterns so if someone talks over someone, there may be a positive or negative thing. If a paragraph is too long, there will be indicators. If people ask the question, why? Um, then that indicates something. And so there are things that you can look at and you can teach staff to look at, not in one chunk, but over a period of time to help them improve. And you start with things like making people feel better because that makes us feel better. And then you can get on to the more technical ones. But the idea that what I want to know is how many of our customers actually went away happier. How many people did we make feel better? You know, just because you hit the metric, is there anything else I can help you with? 
And that is scored by one system, which is true in a huge number of organizations, can be completely misinterpreted because it is that metric over whether or not you helped me at all, and therefore was I annoyed by the fact that you offered to help me again when you, all you've done is made my day worse, actually is useful information if you start to think of it just as an outcome. Did we upset the customer more at the end or the beginning? And so it is about recognizing that we have access to all this complex stuff but recognizing that how we understand things is on a much more simple outcome-based model. And that if we mirror that model, then you can find those things in conversations. If I keep hesitating about something that you're saying to me, you may not be explaining something in a way that's okay. Is there a better way to do it? Now, Big thinking would say, let's give them a thousand ways to do this. Small micro thinking says, let them experiment with different things based on what worked well and what worked badly. And they will continuously improve down that road. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask, we, yeah. we, we're running out of time and we have the last question <laughs> that we need to ask, which we always ask which we call the $9 trillion question. Before so you get to that, can I just give you the answer yeah, to the question, the, yes. the bit that you missed? The difference, uh, all of the difference that you spoke about are true, but what is also in there is what's not said. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of one of the keys to understanding context and outcome. And so now, Nine the trillion. nine trillion dollar question. So, okay. so you promised us in our you promised us in our in our brief chat prior to going live that you wouldn't go dystopian, and yet you've just given us a picture of a world where children can't go outside. So I think I think you've gone pretty dystopian, Morris. Um, but so but I, I'm gonna I'm, I, what I want to do okay. is sort of that, let's have an alternative history here. So we, we think sort of bad organizational practices are, are costing nine trillion dollars a year across the OECD, and and, and you know. What I'm looking to, to, to ask you, if, if you could if you could create an ethically sophisticated but sort of small and simple thinking conversational experience model that every organization goes, ah, that's what we need. And they all started to, to, to embed it into the way they did work. What kind of organizational world would we would we be living in? A better one. Uh, and it doesn't just apply to, it, it, it doesn't just apply, uh, well, I, I suppose, it, yeah, it, it's an organisational thing, because that would have the biggest impact on our culture. Mm. Well, it, it, oh, look, the world is in a terrible mess. So you're talking about people in the pandemic. One of the reasons why I guess I am so positive and excitable is I help people in the pandemic. When this came, you know, when the pandemic hit, my world was hit, my world was hit as well. And I heard about the, the, the efforts working on the pandemic. And so, you know, I got a job at the front line of that pandemic. And I help people. And I believe that, you know, all of those things that we think about positivity and reinforcement, you know, if I can get you to tell one joke, and here's a bit of, uh, of behavioral engineering stuff, that it's known to every single practitioner. Yeah, it, 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 it is that if I can get you to behave in a more jolly way for five minutes, if I can get you into the fresh air, if I can create wellness in you, yeah, and I can create wellness in you a number of times, then actually you'll start to feel well. Now, yes, we, we are in a terrible mess at the moment, but do I think we could sort it out? Yes, because I think that we're also learning more. And I think we're learning to understand the, you know, the worst of our, our terrible mistakes. Morris, 
it's been an amazing experience for me, at least, for the last uh, almost 60 minutes here. I've never um, heard him be so quiet, or I've never heard him be absent so much. I, uh, I'm sorry. I, no. I, do t- I, I do talk too much, guys. No, it's fine. It's no. fine. It was nice watching him on the screen going, uh, uh, trying to get in, uh, trying to get in. Uh, trying to... Maybe, maybe, maybe that's, that's part of the conversational analysis uh, where there's a, something lacking that we should perhaps talk about, but another time.